And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from the Adept Icarus Studios, the, the, the place flying too close to the sun, allegedly. And the frontmen of the upcoming Arium RPG, all about creating worlds and having shenanigans within them. The one and only Will Munn. How are you doing today, man? Hey, Mildred. I'm doing great. Thank, thank you for, thanks for, um, thanks for venturing through the mists that is, that are known as time zones to come all the way up to the temple. Um, now I, I tend to... It's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, as it were. So with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Oof. Uh, that's a good one. So, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess you'd probably imagine, maybe you wouldn't, but, you know, I was, uh, I was a kid in the 80s, and I was kind of, you know, I was a little nerdy. Um, and... I had this 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 kid, this neighborhood kid, uh, who his his big brother would play D and D with him. And uh, one day he was like, "Hey, I want to come over and show you this game that my brother plays with me, right?" So he brought over. I think it had to have been. It wasn't a D and D one e, but it was like. You know, it was, it was basically like Redbox or something, right? Um, and he brought it over and he had a module. And I, for the life of me, I can't remember what one it was. But I, I've searched for it. I've searched and searched because I'd love to have it. Um, but it had a green cover. And that's really about all I can remember. Um, other than, you know, the inside, it was a, you know, it was a dungeon, right? Or, or it was like some some mansion or some mages you know i don't know exactly what it was but but i remember and you know i'm talking about i was like 12 at the time so mm -hmm. that's that's a while ago you don't know you don't know how old i am but i'm old anyway um and uh yeah i was hooked i was immediately hooked we made a character you know i got to play for a little while and then he had to go home because you know we were 12 and um yeah and then the kid moved out of town, like, right after that summer. Uh, and so that was the only time that we ever played. And I just was constantly looking. I'm trying to find somebody. And I grew up in a pretty small town. There weren't a lot of people playing D&D. &D. There were some, but I didn't know any of them. And so I kept looking, kept looking. And eventually um, I found some more people to play with. But that's a different story. Uh, but yeah, I, I kept, I always wanted to play after that first time. Mm -hmm. And now, now, given that it was the, given that it was the eighties, I'm, I've, um, I've got some, get, I've got some guesses about what, what, um, version of D and D it was. Um, my mind keeps, my mind keeps saying Beck me style red box. Um, cause that seems to be the that seems to be the pattern a lot of a lot of these times when somebody gets introduced to D and D around around that time. Mm -hmm. um, but move, moving moving past that, when when it came to the it what was the spark that um that led to the creation of Arium? Um. So so I don't know. It was probably about five years ago or so. I I decided, you know, I was gonna. So I've been in tech. I've been in tech for ages, right? And mm -hmm. um, and I used to do sidekicks a lot, right? And so I'd go and I'd go do you know coding for another company or for a startup or something like that on the side in the evening. And uh, and then I'd go to my normal day job, and then I, at one point something clicked, and I just decided I didn't want to do that anymore, right? I was like, yeah, mm -hmm. it's kind of, I'm done with it, right? I code all day, I don't want to do it at night, too. And so 
Um, I've always loved stories. Uh, I've always been a big reader. I had read tons and tons growing up. I filled my D&D shaped hole in my heart with books. And so I, I read lots and lots of books. And I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write. I want to write. Right? And my dad used to write. And so I thought, you know, this will be fun. I'm going to quit, you know, doing this other stuff. And I'm going to quit mostly playing video games, right? I still, you know, I play board games. And and uh, and I had taken a break from RPGs for a few years at that point. I thought, mm-hmm. I'm going to write novels. And so I tried to write a couple novels and, you know, and some stories and stuff. And that didn't really stick for me. But what did stick was um, kind of hanging out with writers, right? And so I'd, I'd go to a writing group and I'd go to writing conventions and, and uh, after a while, I'd go to writing conventions. I felt like all the stuff I went to, you know, I'd go to sessions, and I started to feel like it all was, you know, stuff I'd heard before. And so I thought, well, what if, uh, what if I get on the circuit and do some presenting, since I know most of the stuff they're talking about, right? Mm-hmm. And so I tried to get on some of that, and me and my buddy uh, Drew, who is one of the writers on Arium, uh, we put together this little dog and pony show where we uh got together with a group of people in a room and we've done this with you know a room of 20 people or so or somewhere in that neighborhood and built a world together right and we used basically the bones of of what is arium um to do that mm-hmm. so that's where it started started out as a yeah as a as a writer's workshop basically so Arium is purported to be split into two books, Create and Discover. And would it be correct of me to assume that um, the Create book is where the bulk of the um, world building takes place and the Discover is where the um, role-playing game end of, end of things takes place? Hang on. Oh, and we're back. We're back. Apologies for that. Um. I was, I was asking is when it comes to the two books, um, create and discover. Would it be would it be fair of me to assume that create um, ha- is focused on the world building part of it, and discover is focused on the role playing part of it? Yeah, that's totally accurate. Um, create is create is a, is very much that exercise that we did in that. Uh, in that writing at, at a writing conference, and we did it at several of them actually, but um, fine tuned a lot, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and turned into something that you can you know you can run with any group of people and and really tuned toward RPGs as opposed to you know writers and books. Um, whereas you know with writers, often you know, world building is kind of a thing that you know they always love to do, and it's and it's not that big of a deal to them to, to have it be kind of free flowing and loose and, you know, whatever happens happens type of thing. But you have to have some rules around the table, I think, to, to just enable everybody's fun. Uh, if you're, if you're going to do it with an RPG group. And so we have a few rules that, that kind of streamline it for folks and make it so that, um, yeah, so that it's just easy to run with an RPG group. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then dis- go ahead. And with the disco- and with discover, it's that's where um a lot, it's, I'm guessing that's where a good chunk of the uh, dice rolling is actually going to happen. Absolutely, yeah. You wouldn't use uh, dice with create at all, uh, generally speaking. It's usually either going to be sticky notes or or a an online um, like a shared document or a, a Trello board or, or something. A lot of people don't know what that is, but I just named a thing that we like to use for mm-hmm. our streams and things, um, which is really nice. 
Uh, it's, yeah, so Discover is definitely where the dice chunking comes into play. Um, but there's still, it still has that element of, um, of world building in it where you can kind of create something on the fly potentially to, to help along the way. Um, it can be, it can be fun, uh, for, for players and GMs. We actually have a, um, I'm still waffling on the name of this part of it because we, it's it's a newer component that I just don't know if I love the name that we came up for it with. But anyway, like I, we call it an Arium Storm, where mm -hmm. uh, you can spend a couple of your tokens. You're going to have you know tokens that you can spend during that part of the game, and you can have the entire group uh, come together and basically generate ideas for how to help you out in this situation that you're in, right? By either creating new people or new uh, goodies or new, you know, could be a new anything in the world, basically, that will help your character at that point in time. You have to spend a couple. You only get three tokens, so you have to spend a couple in order to kick off one of those. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, it can be pretty powerful. And and the whole, the whole group gets into it. Yeah. Now... When, when it comes to now, when it comes to the um, individual bo individual books, I believe um, mm -hmm. um, I believe they're both they're both meant to be fairly light about um, or, um about less than f less than fifty pages each, from what yep. I understand. Yep, that's right. Uh, so, create is completely done. It's all laid out. The PDF is ready to go to backers as soon as the Kickstarter campaign ends and is and we get our money from Kickstarter. So it's 48 pages plus the cover, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Discover, we still are doing a few minor revisions on, but we expect it'll be similar length. Yeah. Um, is that now that's... E that's I'm guessing that even with the stretch goals, it's... it's um, it's still going. It's still going to be um, under that range. Yeah, that's correct. So our stretch goals are mainly digital. Uh, so we're doing uh, another another PDF uh, called Arium Bridge, and that one is uh, the Alan Barr is writing that. If you're familiar with him, mm -hmm. of Gallant Knight Games, so he's writing rules to to sort of bridge the gap between uh, Arium and 5e, Fate, and Tiny D6, which is the Gallant Knight Games line, which is really good, by the way. I, if you like minimalism, that's a great game. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also have Arium Flash, which is from another stretch goal, <clears throat> uh, which is another PDF, and that is all uh, writers and RPG authors providing guidance on how to basically set up the, set the stage for an adventure of a particular you know theme or genre because um, we want to provide help for GMs right so that mm -hmm. when they when their group creates this crazy new or, or this sorry this ooh, I shouldn't use that word this amazing new world this um, you know thing that's never been seen before at least probably not by any of them uh, that that the GM has, you know, a resource that they can go to, to, you know, pick up a story and just run with it if the group wants to play right then. Because it is only about, I think it's around two hours to put together um, an Arium with Arium Create. And what now when it comes to, now, um, when it comes to the when it comes to the create part of it, um, I'm curious how I'm curious how that. Now I'd imagine part of it is a is a kind of round the table round the table approach. Um, before we went live, I'd mentioned that I'd done something not too far removed with um, Mystic Empyrean. Um, mm -hmm. But how I know there's def there's definitely the steps that are mentioned, but how mm -hmm. it. How does the round robinness work within um, Arium? Yeah, that's great. That's a great question. So, and that's kind of the that's kind of the magic sauce of it all, to be honest, right? I mean, you can you can add or remove steps potentially, right? 
we're saying we want to have lacunae, which is what isn't in the area, and we want to have uh, universal, which is, you know, what's the genre, what's the theme, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. We want the big picture, which is, you know, are there countries, are there worlds, are there cities, are there wars, are there, you know, things like that. And then we, we keep going and get more and more specific until you get down to individual people and uh, and items that might be in the world. And along the way, <clears throat> so each during each one of those steps, we're going to go through kind of our kind of our uh, sort of an anvil, right? We have to hone down whatever's whatever ideas come in and figure out how to uh, how to get them down to something that everyone in the group loves. Because I've made that claim on multiple occasions, right? That the group is going to love what they create. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and and that sounds like it's really hard um, but the system that we put together I've never seen somebody not love what we what what came out of uh, of a, an area create session never seen it and we have done a lot of playing this game with a lot of different people so here's how it works um, your group sits down and they 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 set a timer Right, and they're going to write a bunch of really small ideas, maybe maybe three or four ideas each, right? And they're going to do it in a short amount of time, so those ideas aren't perfect, but we don't want them to be perfect, right? We want them to be something that the person is willing to see ways to improve it, right? Mm-hmm. And so they jot down those ideas, and then depending on how big your group is, you're going to have you know nine or twelve or fifteen or whatever ideas. And then they're going to take those ideas and they're going to talk about them for a minute, right? I like to have everybody read their own, but that's not necessary. Um, so you talk about them and you are going to combine them for one of two reasons. You'll combine them if they're basically the same or, or really similar, right? Or you'll combine them if they're more awesome together than they are apart, period. Mm-hmm. And then you, you go through and you do that with all of them. Um, and, and both players have to agree, right? They have to say, yeah, I want to I wanna combine these two things because it wouldn't make sense if they didn't agree, right? And then once you get all of that done, then everybody votes. And we, we engage a little democratic process and, we, and everybody votes on uh, the ones they like the best. The ones that get the most votes, well, they're in. The ones that don't get any votes, they're out. And the ones that are somewhere in between, well, maybe the GM hangs on to those because who knows? They might make an appearance, mm-hmm. um, but but they aren't canon, right? Not until somebody, not until the GM brings them in. So the ones that are canon, then we use those as the basis for everything that comes in the following rounds because, like I said, this thing always builds on itself. So it's always building on on what you voted in in the previous round. So everything has to kind of stay uh, homogeneous, right, with that. Yeah, I can, I can, um, I can definitely go, I can definitely go with that. Now, when it comes to the time part, when it comes to the time part of that, um, Mm -hmm. has the question ever been raised about how, how that would work if somebody was using this for, say, play by post oh uh, <laughs> yeah i i've actually been doing that so i have uh we've got this little promotion for the kickstarter called uh our area our way it's a it's a twitter hashtag and it's definitely not trending but there are some people following along right and we're we're building an area basically play by post but we're doing it play by twitter chat right so i've got like eight or nine people in the group and they're all I'm like giving them instructions through chat and then they're building it out um, on on you know a Trello board like I mentioned before uh, which is just a shared board where you can have ideas on separate cards that you can vote on them and move them around and stuff it just makes it easy mm-hmm. and nice uh, <clears throat> and so so yeah there's so I had to make an adjustment right said well how's that gonna work and, and what we do is we just limit the number of words that they can use uh, on a card. And that seems to that seems to bear the same 
weight, basically. What you don't want is somebody who writes a novel and says, okay, here's my idea, I love it, or we have to, everybody vote for this because it's my dream, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we don't want. We want small, concise ideas that don't, that aren't, you know, the perfect idea, and then they work together to create the perfect idea. Yeah. Um, or at the, or at the very, either the perfect idea or the, um, the least, or the least, the least or most <laughs> dumb idea, depending on what your table yeah, yes, has their preferences exactly. as, because, um, <laughs> We here in the monastery do a whole, do a wholeheartedly um, endorse the creation and use and abuse of what may be professionally referred to as dumb shit. Yeah, there's been plenty of that in in, in games that I've been a part of. <laughs> um, which the which given the whole card thing that you mentioned, that does bring another question that I ha that I have to bring up, and that is. How do you, how do you adjust how do you adjust for the advent of virtual tabletop? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question, and it's one that I don't think we've really fully answered entirely yet. I mean, I think there are there are some you know other ways that you can do online games where, and this is what we've done, right? We've just kept kept characters in you know uh, Google Sheets or whatever. We've kept kept our ariums in, in Trello and, and things like that. But I think at some point there has to be a, there has to be something there, right? Because especially with, you know, the state of the world today, adoption of virtual tabletops is going way up. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, yeah, it's definitely something that it's on the radar for sure. Right. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't come right out and say, you know, we're making, you know, Arium character sheets on roll twenty. I wouldn't say that, um, <laughs> but it's definitely something we're thinking about. Yeah. Um, now, when it comes to the when it comes to the creation phases, um, I want I wanted to go through some of them and just and just get the uh, details about what about what the general vibe of that particular phase is. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, now the first obviously would be lacune. I'm hoping I got that mm -hmm. right. Would that would that basically be the general concept of that given world, or is that just, or is lacune just the act of getting everybody's asses to the table? Um, it's not. It's uh, it's uh, so I stole this wholesale from Christopher Gray. If you know Christopher Gray, who wrote mm -hmm. uh, World's Happiest Apocalypse and um, and uh, Great American Novel. I actually, Great American Novel is where I first saw this idea, and I loved it. Um, and it is, it's actually the opposite of that, of, of any of the other steps. It is what is not part of this world. That's what it is. And so you, you uh, get everybody together and you say, hey, we're going to play a game. We're going to create this world together. And, you know, Jimmy says, well, gosh... I have been playing nothing but the One Ring RPG, and I want anything as far away from Tolkien as I possibly can. Or, you know, I just don't like dinosaurs. I don't want dinosaurs in, in, in the world that we create. Right? Or, or whatever the case may be. I don't think anybody really hates dinosaurs, but come on. Um, and so that's sort of the purpose of that. And we also use, we also use that time uh, to, you know, potentially interject safety tools like particularly if you're playing with people that you don't know well or or things like that so you can you can use that phase to enter like some lines and veils or things like that if you'd like mm -hmm. um i can i can definitely see that and um some, and i'll give i'll give you props for referencing the one ring and t which which i'm totally giving you props on that for reasons, other, for reasons other than I, just, I reviewed that last month. <laughs> uh, it's one of the greatest games, one of the greatest RPGs. I um, yeah. yeah, I did last last month. I did a whole retrospective on um, Tolkien RPGs, um, mm. which of course meant I had to dig up my copy of um, uh, of Merp, which um, yeah. 
I will hear. I will hear. I will hear no guff from anyone who set, who who looks at a more recent game and set, and says that it's too complicated. To the point where I tweeted <laughs> out, anybody who complains to me about about um, a game that's come out in the last five years being too complicated will be beaten with my copy of Merp. Survivors will be beaten <laughs> twice. <laughs> Uh, I didn't. I, I didn't give you the history of after my first game, but Merp was my second game. So yeah. I, so you're I, familiar with Char Hell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I get it. <laughs> I, mean, I like it. I, I like the criticals, but um, I have a, yeah. I have a hard time. I have a hard time recommending it to pe to people simply because of simply because of the fact that well. They're gonna, there's gonna, there's gonna be a learning curve. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Um, I love the One Ring though because I feel like its uh, its mechanics are so evocative of of the the theme and the story of you know that world of Middle Earth, right? Which that's that's is, what I love about it. Which is saying something, given how much of a royal pain dealing with the dealing with the um, Tolkien estate can be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I have heard that about it. Yeah, I've I've gotten I've gotten first hand, I've gotten first hand info that they can that they can be a royal pain because of how anal they are about what you can put in. Hmm. But anyway, um, so I'm guessing universal the universal phase is the things that you're allowed the things that you're going to be putting in. Right. Yeah, that's where you start with that. And so in the universal step, you're basically going through and, and you're deciding, you know, what is there, or do we want to associate any genres, right? Do we want sci-fi or do we want cyberpunk or, you know, do we want sword and sorcery or, or whatever, right? But also it can be tone, it can be flavor, right? It mm -hmm. can, you know, it can be, you could say something like, well, I want a, I want a noir fantasy or I want, you know, um, I, I want it to be you know, gritty, or I want it to be, you know, light and happy, or I want it to be silly, right? We talked about, you know, <laughs> we talked about the type of games you like, right? So mm -hmm. that's, that's the time when you add that part in, right? And the group is going to agree or, uh, well, they will, because, you know, whatever, whatever gets the most votes and, and almost without question, there'll be something that, you know, sort of stands out that everybody likes or a couple things. Mm -hmm. And, and when it's a couple, it's even better, right? Because, you know, maybe you had somebody who said, well, I want noir and, and everybody really gels with that and they like it. And somebody else had sci-fi and everybody kind of likes that too. And those two bubble up to the top. Well, congratulations. You're probably playing noir sci-fi, right? Yep. And great. The only thing that I the only thing that I would ha that I would um put some sort of caveat in is is making so that when playing noir sci-fi it totally doesn't end up being the Blade Runner PC game. I think I lost you for a second. Yeah, I was saying I was yeah. saying no noir meets sci-fi, so this is totally not us trying to recreate the Blade Runner PC game. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yep. Definitely not. But it's, you know, it's whatever the group comes up with. I'm just going with an example, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the next part of it is, if somebody really wanted something and not enough people voted for it, they can add it, right? At that point, they can add it. They, uh, they, everybody gets three creation tokens. And so if, uh, you know, one person really wanted, um, I don't know, um, like some fantasy aspects or something like that, and that was that was their item, and maybe it only got their vote. Um, then they could they could put it in at that point, right? Mm -hmm. it's usually, like the group to agree, especially when it's something at a higher level like that. But but uh, especially as you get into the later steps, it's it's pretty easy to say, oh, you want this person, you know, as part of the world? Great, use your creation token, no problem. Um, when it's more universal, we we like to, you know, get buy-in. But yeah. All right. Um, so I'm guessing phase I'm guessing phase two, big picture, is where the is where the concept really starts getting hammered down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Yeah, definitely still conceptual at this point, right? Um, but it's it's bringing in bigger bigger constructs like you know continents, potentially wars. I mentioned before, if there is magic or technology or something like that, how accessible is it? How does it work? How you know what's it look like, um, and how does it influence other things? Um, and so that's where those kind of elements come in. All right, I got you. Um, so with culture and organizations, I think that'd be self -exp self explanatory. Yeah, pretty much. Um, it's you know beliefs, people, heritages, um, legends, secret groups, schools, institutions, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, with and if, would the same apply when it with the same self explanatoryness comply with um. Or not, not, not comply. Apply when it comes to landmarks. Yeah, for the most part, I think that the thing to note about landmarks is that uh, you should be able to point to it on a street level map, right? It shouldn't be really huge, but it also probably shouldn't be really small. It's not a rock, right? But it's mm -hmm. also not, you know, the ring from Halo. Yeah. Um. Would so, would. Was some was something the size of a yes of certain certain um skyscrapers also count? Absolutely, yeah. Um. Now, when it comes to people, I'm guessing I'm guessing some of that is uh, which is phase five, and I'm guessing some of that builds off of phase three when it comes to culture and organizations. Uh, yeah. So it does. I mean, they all they all come from. Um, everything's building on the steps before, right? You might introduce a person uh, who is the proprietor of a landmark that is a member of an organization that is, uh, you know, um, someone who has magic that was defined in the big picture, right? So it all sort of trickles down to uh, that step. The The thing that's neat about the the people step is that you know, you're not only defining de or defining people who um, exist, right? You're also introducing people who probably your GM will play as NPCs, or that the players uh, can claim to be their own character. Yep. The last one, um, goodies. What does that one entail? Because when I think of what goodies can entail, there's there's the intelligent part of my brain that that is con that's considering what that could entail, and then there's the shit post part of my brain that's considering what that entails. <laughs> yeah, uh, goodies are well, we like to think of them as things that are narratively important. So by all means, uh, include the adventurers pack, include uh, a lantern. Mm -hmm. whatever right include a rock it doesn't matter but if you include it then it's gonna have to be important somehow right i think one time we had someone include um a soulless left shoe and by golly <laughs> it got voted in and that thing was uh, narratively important in the game it's the old Chekhov's gun rearing its head again <laughs> yeah um now, when it comes to the whole idea of creation tokens, I note that it's described as a yes and button, effectively. Yeah. Um, the first qu first question that I have on that is, when it comes to that particular button, is it a, is it a case where it will let, where um that's building on some on someone else's suggestion, and two, do you only get three um three creation tokens? Period. Or do you only get three at each uh, phase? No, you get three. Period for the whole for the whole shebang. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. So you can build on someone else's idea with a creation token. You can also, you know, you can you can say, "Gosh, here's the thing that didn't get voted in, and I want it, right?" And so you're gonna you'll make it part of the part of the world. Um, or yeah, that's mainly it. But there's also the potential to use any that are left over, um, because if you didn't use them, then 
when it comes time to uh, claim characters and goodies, uh, they're the tiebreakers. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes... Now, um, whenever there's this sort of limited resource, I've noticed that there's always been the temptation for players to um, be a bit... Def um, use that kind of resource a bit defensively or a bit conservatively. Has that been a thing that's happened during playtesting? Um, yeah, it can, and, and and I think that's fine too. Uh, but no matter what, the the creation tokens are going to turn over when you when you move into character creation, uh, because any that are left over at that point just become um, additional attribute points for your for your point by for your character. Uh, all right, so. Now, when it comes to when it comes to discovery, um, and I, and I, I know it's called discover, but um, old habits die hard. Um, <laughs> so it's a it's mentioned that it's a D six based system, but um, mm -hmm. just using D six ha can ha can have a lot of can have a lot of variables. I mean, the old West, the old Star Wars D six and um, Shadowrun both use six sided die, but they don't use them anything alike. So. Right. How are how are D six utilized in Arium? Um, well, it's it's a dice pool, so that's that's similar to um, to both Shadowrun and um, West End Games, mm -hmm. right? And I, I actually worked on the Zoro RPG, which uses West End Games Second Edition. Um, it isn't using West End Games Second Edition, for the record. Um, and it's not that like it, um, but it, so it's using a dice pool. You're going to have, you know, a score for your core attributes. You're going to have, um, four core attributes, mm -hmm. uh, mind, body, heart, and spirit. And then those turn in, are those, um, um, basically allow us to calculate the secondary attributes uh, and those are the things you roll there's no skills it's not mm -hmm. a skill based system which it'd be really hard to do skills on something with as broad a possibility as what what we've kind of brought to the table from from the area that you created right mm -hmm. uh, and so you're basically going to roll your skill or not your skill sorry your attribute uh, and however many points you have in it that's how many dice you roll uh, and you're looking for fives and sixes on those, and those are successes. So you're going to have a target that the GM sets for the thing that you're going to do. They may tell you the target, or they may not tell you the target. A, a default target is two successes. Um, and yeah, and then you've got some you've got some ways to modify those roles um, based on what boons and banes your character has. Uh, and you also get some discovery tokens that'll, you know, let you uh, maybe do a reroll, or like I mentioned before, um, spawn off a a storm that will, you know, let everybody create something that that helps you out in the nick of time, type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, let me think a little bit more on. So yeah, there's so it's a. It's a pool of D6s with a target. Um, you have the potential to roll boxcars or snake eyes, which is going to give you either control or a complication. And those are mainly narrative, although it is, you know, a, a narrative success, um, which, you know, can, can translate into something better than what you initially intended to do or a narrative failure, right? Yep. Um, which often the GM will either narrate or give the player the opportunity to do it too. It can, can go either way. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes, now when it comes to the way, when it comes to the way that the, um, primary and derived attributes are set up on the character sheet. Um, mm -hmm. Would it be presented in a similar way to the diagram that you've got on the Kickstarter page? Uh, I mean, hopefully, 
but we don't have that piece laid out yet. So the intent is for it to look like that because we like the way that looks, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm not I'm not entirely sure. I've got a I have plans to chat with our layout uh, artist and and figure out what the what the next step is on how we how we work that. But yeah, we like that because it's evocative and it and it shows exactly what the relationships are and it's pretty clean and concise. All right. Now, when it comes to the concept of um, boons and banes, I'm guessing these would be your typical advantages and disadvantages. And hang on a second, this damn ping. Um, gotcha. When when it comes to boons and when it comes to boons and banes, I'm guessing that would fall into the, fall under the purview of um of of the of your typical advantages and disadvantages that are often seen in a universal style game. Um, kind of, yeah. Uh, so there are specific uh, benefits that they give. Um, they are, <clears throat> so it, de- it depends, right? And you can, you get to choose, um, the, the benefit that they give cost a point, uh, and you can, you know, you have more than one point potentially to spend like a new, a brand new character is going to have two boom points and one bane point that they need to spend to, mm-hmm. before their character is created. And that's on the character themselves. And then goodies will have boons and banes as well. That's actually how they work also. Um, and so it, it just depends on what you choose. Um, the options include uh, adding two, two dice to your dice pool, right, under the right circumstance, uh, gaining advantage, which means, you know, you'll succeed on fours, fives, and sixes instead of fives and sixes, uh, or adding an extra dice um, that is an automatic six. That's examples of boons. And the banes are basically just the opposite of that. Those are all the one point ones, by the way. I didn't mention the two point one, but the one point banes are: you take two dice away, you gain disadvantage, which you only succeed on sixes, or you add one dice with an automatic one on it instead of an automatic six. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Now, when it com- now, a common um a common issue that happens with universal games w- within their uh, character creation is the min max problem, mm-hmm. and obviously this is this isn't something that can be completely removed. But what steps would you say that you've taken to minimize um, min maxing? I mean, I don't think I don't think you can entirely take it away. Not from any game, really. I mean, you can you character. I've had players min max like crazy in any game mm-hmm. right that i've ever played um but i do think that the way that the attributes are set up um encourage players to to um put points in different things because if you put all your points in one thing then you're going to be really terrible at a lot of stuff right mm-hmm. um so uh, let's see i think i still have our our test spreadsheet uh, that we're using up here somewhere, and I can just I can just run a quick number for you and tell you exactly what would happen if you put all of your points in uh, if you put all your points in body, for example. So let's say we put seven points in body, and that would leave one point for social, or sorry, for heart, and one point for. Um, spirit one point for mind mm-hmm. right and that means you'll be very good at body obviously uh, you'll have a four in stamina which is decent it gives you a good health um, it gives you a four in defense and a four in offense and then you are absolutely terrible at everything else so mind spirit heart awareness which is initiative uh, willpower and social are all very bad in that scenario. So you you can min max to an extent, right? But it's it's pr- it's pretty difficult. Um, and because the primary attack and and defense um, are are calculated rather than one of the primary attributes, 
mm-hmm. um, then you know you can't just come out swinging with seven dice um, in the beginning. You might be really good at lifting something, right, or running, but you're not going to be good at fighting. Not great, anyway. Mm-hmm. So this, so this would be a setup where, um, ha- where having a relatively even spread would be favorable. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um. In that, re- so with in that regard, I'm guessing that. For that the that um when it comes to when it comes to character creation, um, the the main focus is going to ha- is going to be on point by. Would mm-hmm. that be correct? Yep. Point by and then assigning the boons and banes. Those are definitely yeah. the the two main. Yep. Which do, which does which does address a um concern that I ha- that I had at that I had early on, which was. Whether or not the points you use for the attributes and the points you use for boons and banes were going to be drawing on the same resource. Mm-hmm. No, they're separate. As I was worried that there was going to be a, that there was going to be a setup like that simply because I've seen that I've seen that kind of thing happen in Universal games and mm-hmm. the in, the intent is understandable, but the pro, the problem is is that it leads to it leads to a bit of skewing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you can add some more goodies potentially to mm-hmm. your character during uh, during when you're doing the claiming with your mm-hmm. leftover creation tokens. Yeah. So so somebody could potentially come in with more goodies, like one or two, at most, as opposed to keeping those extra points for attributes or using them to ensure that something is included in the world that they really loved. Um, but it's yeah, it's fairly minimal. You you really can't come in with something that's you know just unbelievable. Um, not not unless that's what your group wants, right? I mean, if mm-hmm. if you want to play a superhero game and your goal is to come in with you know everybody comes in with five boons or whatever, then you can absolutely do that if that's what you want to do. Um, and and it'll be fun, right? I mean, my experience with characters that have higher number of boons and goodies and things is that you know it can be pretty it can be pretty good um as long as the group is you know fairly fairly balanced um now one thing i'm curious about is of of all the dice to use with this particular setup why'd you go with um d6s was it just because of that background with working on the um west end d6 system in the past or was there a different reason you're back. Um, what I what I was going to ask before Discord rudely interrupted me was, why specifically did you go with um, D sixes? Um, for for this particular setup, was it a case of just that's a, that was a more familiar uh, die setup f- for you, yeah. or was there some was there a different reason? Um, well, I do like D sixes, uh, but I and and I should. I should give credit where credit is due because mm, a big part of the rules in Discover are designed by Natasha Hens, right? Mm-hmm. And so the D six the D six is hers um, for this, and her to hear her tell it, right? It is because everybody has D sixes in the house, and <laughs> it's you know we we want people to be able to play with you know a pile of D sixes and a stack of sticky notes and a and a sharpie or a pencil or something, right? And they can they can play this game. Right, although it's a lot easier if you have a character sheet and you know a dice tray and you know some things like that. But but realistically, you can play it pretty quickly, and you don't have to have a lot of stuff with you to do it. Um, when it come now, um, now one of the other things that I did I did see was um was receiving on uh, discovery tokens now. In a lot of systems, there's often some sort of extra effort um, system. Would mm-hmm. discovery tokens count under that, or would or would that be used um, differently? Um, I think it's a little different. It's it's not so much extra effort. You're not like taking stress or something like that, mm-hmm. or um, 
it's it's more continuing with the theme right of um this is a world that we created together and we want to continue to build it together and so when you use a discovery token it's discovering more about the world all right all right now when it comes now um when it comes when it comes to a lot of the, when it comes to a lot of the die rules would do you have do you have it set up where the um where difficulties would be static or are most of the die rolls that happen in REM um opposed rolls? Uh it's mainly static, um, but there are opposed rolls and that is usually um so like named mm. you know, named uh opponents, things like that, right? If you're uh, if I don't know if you've You've probably looked at and probably even played Blades in the Dark, but we yeah. liked their their methodology for um, how you kind of handle, you know, low level goons and and things like that. And so, so we're doing something similar to that for, you know, kind of the the uh, the rabble, right? Mm -hmm. But you're gonna have a you're gonna have someone or maybe multiple someones. Uh, that your group is going to face, or maybe you know something potentially too, and that's going to be a fully you know rolled character with boons and banes and the whole nine, and and there will be so there are opposed roles are definitely possible, um, but we do err on the side of targets. Um, now I'm get now the other. It's funny. It's funny that you, given my history with it, it's funny that you did bring up um, um, West the West End D six system because that brings me to one of to one of its relics and whether or not there was a temptation to include this within within the set within the uh, setup and that's the old wild die. Yeah, uh, I mean we we talked about it a little bit, but no, we don't, there's not a wild die and we didn't we didn't include it. Um, I know, you know, it's in Savage Worlds, it's in Western games, and, and those are great games, and I really, I, I really, like, I love that system. I played, I played Western game Star Wars quite a bit, um, and, you know, and obviously worked on Zorro, and, and, and I love the system, um, but no, we didn't, that's not the game we're making, so it didn't make sense for us. Yeah. Um. When it comes now, um, you've done you've done a handful of play tests with it and a hand a handful of um demonstra of demonstrations, mm -hmm. and looking at looking at it from that perspective and just instead of looking at it from a design perspective, what would what were some of the takeaways from those experiences? From the play tests. Yeah, from from uh, from the uh, play games? tests and uh, demonstrations. Um. I think we learned a lot along the way, to be honest. I mean, we were playtesting this t two years ago, two and a half years ago, something mm -hmm. like that. We were playtesting the create part definitely at least that long ago. And the discover part, we were playtesting at least a year and a half ago. Um, and, yeah, I mean, you, you, you can't possibly take some concept that you had on paper and know everything about how it's going to work I don't think um, without getting it in front of some people um, and you'll find you'll find rough edges right and you then you go and you file those off uh, or or you you know you build something around them to make them softer um, I prefer the file off method personally but um, yeah uh, examples let me think of some examples for you there's truckloads um, we didn't have any tokens in the beginning. Mm -hmm. That was not a thing, right? Like creation tokens, we didn't have any creation tokens. And so people would just build the world and then occasionally you'd have someone that's like, yeah, but I really wanted that thing, you know? I really wanted it. We're like, well, sorry, get more people to vote for your thing next time, right? Um, but adding the creation tokens is a vital element. To, to making that component of the world building work because we need something for those players, right? Um, and 
uh, and it just worked out that, you know, not everyone always used them. And so we're thinking, well, do we give them less? Hmm, not necessarily. And so we, you know, we built a system around them that works. Um, so that's, that's an, that's a good example, I think of one. Yeah. Um, were there any things in the, er, in some of the early drafts that, um, that you thought would have been, that you thought would have really worked, but, um, upon play testing kind of got phased out? Uh, yeah. Um, culture and organizations used to be two different steps. Uh, we, we put, uh, our original, um, create had, uh, gosh, what did it have? It had, um, well, I don't know if I want to tell you this cause I think I'm going to bring it back for like, uh, a different thing. Well, I'm definitely bringing it back for a different thing. I'm going to keep that one to myself. Uh, I'm trying to think of other, there were a couple of other steps. We went through a, a pretty long list. The list used to be like 10 steps and we really honed it down to, to the ones that we have. And I think some of those might apply in other situations, mm -hmm. particularly one of them, but, um, but they certainly didn't apply in the initial world creation. Um, one thing that we talked about doing was relationships because, you know, if you look at like fate or powered by the apocalypse or a lot of these other story driven games they develop relationships in the beginning of the game and we decided not to add that because you know we we kind of want the group to come up with that just a touch more organically um although it might be interesting i mean we we did test it that way once or twice and didn't dig it but you know for somebody who likes to hack or whatever they could definitely add that in and, and play with it um, from Discover, if you look at uh, at the way control and complication work, for example, right? So originally that was you had to roll 50% or more of your dice. Had to be sixes to get control, or 50% or more of your dice had to be um, uh, ones for complication. I don't know if you're getting this. I think you. I might have cut out. Um I'm going to. Oh, did you? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Where did I cut out? Um, I didn't hear. I didn't hear you cut out at all. Oh, okay. Um, good. So yeah. So then we went to the we went to the box cars or snake eyes on um, complication and and control, which is better. It's easier. It's faster, right? Mm -hmm. And it also doesn't make you get controls and complications all the time when you only have two dice in something. Um, in that case, you could roll a one and a six, and you've got control and complication on the same roll, and mm -hmm. that's that has a pretty high a pretty high probability of coming up when you only have two dice. Yeah. Now, with that, now with that, and with the with all that said, um. So there's, unless now unless I'm mis unless I'm mistaken, yeah, there there's nine days to go on the on the um, Kickstarter. You managed, and I'll congratulate you on managing to break through your your initial um, goal for about sixteen times over. Well, getting close to that, <laughs> it'll probably be, it'll probably be sixteen times over by the time this by the time everybody sees this. Um, thank you. When when every when all the extra baggage shakes out, shakes out with the uh, Kickstarter, um, mm -hmm. what what do you see as far as the release window for um, Arium? Like, are you thinking mm -hmm. before the end of the year? Um, we would. That's I mean that's our optimistic target, right? If you look at what's on the. Uh, if you look at what's on the Kickstarter, I think we said January for the PDF and February for the print. Um, it's, yeah, that our optimistic target, what we would love to do is for people to see this sooner. Obviously, we didn't want to commit to that because we want to, you know, we want to delight people with how fast we can deliver the thing that we said that we wanted to deliver. <laughs> but uh, but if, 
if we can't do that, then, you know, we'll hit our targets. That's our goal, right, is to absolutely hit our targets of January and February. Um, as far as the PDF goes, like I mentioned before, the Arium Create PDF goes out uh, the day we get funds from Kickstarter. So mm -hmm. all backers are going to get that right away. Uh, Discover, like I mentioned, we're doing a few final, you know, revisions after some of these very last round of, of play. Um, the Actually, the control and complication ruling change came from, from those games um, and a couple of other really sort of very minor things. Um, so we're going to revise the rules, then run it through editing and layout. Um, and then once that's done, just as soon as we get it into PDF, we'll get that PDF out to people and then we'll, we'll send them both off for print which according to our printer is like a two week turnaround. It's not that bad. And we're printing in the U S mm -hmm. and shipping from the U S uh, unless we can figure out a better, Hey, if anybody's listening to this and you are, you know, in uh, UK or Eurozone and you have some thoughts on how we can get better rates on shipping by potentially printing and, um, shipping maybe 100 or 200 copies of Arium Create and Arium Discover in that zone. We would love more info on that. You can find me, uh, William, at adaptacurus.com. Mm -hmm. Now, and I'll, de I'll definitely be looking forward to seeing what sort of craziness um, shakes out once, once that happens. Because... Mm -hmm. It's in, it's as inevitable as a falling rock. We I think we all I think we all know this. <laughs> and with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity. Love it. And thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm. And there will be plenty more. And um, anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Um, and of course, I want to give a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy this bit of this bit of crazy. And there will be more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody!